It's so good to see you. I hope your day was was good. Um, you know, the devil's are really not very smart. And he tries the same thing time and time again. I'm like, it didn't work the last 15. Why do you think it's going to work this time? But it seems like every time that he doesn't want something said um, or talked about, he tries to throw a little hitch in the way. So I got to enjoy uh, the wonderful singing out there in the audience with you. And I'm so happy to uh, be part of this church. And I'm so proud of each and every one of you. Um, you know, if you join a football team, you would think it was really strange if they gave you a ballet outfit. You would think, mm, that's not right. Or in the middle of the winter time, if you see somebody dressed in shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops, it, it looks a little strange. It's very important that we dress, not only for success, but we dress for the atmosphere that we're in. And so that goes physical, and we think that's kind of comical, but how many of us know that there's times spiritually where we don't feel like we're dressed for it? We it came out of the blue, and you weren't see it coming, and you just were not prepared. Well, Paul in the Bible, he tells us that we're going to have battles. And I like that Paul is a visual kind of guy because he kind of paints a picture sometimes in his words, and it helps me to understand what he's saying. And at this one time when he wrote about something so common of verses that we'll read here in a little bit about God's armor, his spiritual armor, he was actually in his prison cell, and he was watching how the Roman soldiers, how they dressed for battle. And in his mind, he saw in the spiritual world about what we need to be able to succeed in these battles. And so I want to read quickly in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 through 18. In case you haven't heard of this dress code before, I want to read it for you. He's talking about the church in Ephesus at this time. He's writing a letter because he knows that his days are numbered. And he wants his fellow brothers and sisters to be prepared. So he says, finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put it on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He gave us the outline, the dress code. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. He gave us the, the outline and the dress code of how to fight these battles that we're going to have. He refers to it as the evil day. We all have an evil day in our life. That's where all of a sudden your whole world is shattered. I think I would call that evil, wouldn't you? And he tells us what to do in those times because, see, when your world shatters and falls apart, if you don't have a foundation, if you don't know how to pick up the tools to fight and rebuild a life on a solid foundation, you'll have a tendency to want to throw in the towel, to quit, to run away, because we don't like to be uncomfortable. But Paul tells us in this life, you're going to have some battles. See, all of our physical conflicts, they have a spiritual root to them. That's why... When something, somebody has a certain kind of personality trait that maybe is not the best to have, 
Rather than looking at that, I quickly want to see underneath the surface of what is the cause of that. See, people don't want to just be angry to be angry because it's a lot of work. It causes a lot of issues in your life. But why are they angry? It's because there's a root of something that never got addressed, and most of that has been felt like their needs weren't met, either emotionally, spiritually. And so we have to, we attack the person when really the person's just a vessel. The person is just the fruit of that. What we have to do is we have to fight against the root of that, of what is causing those issues in our life. And so he tells us, you don't fight against flesh, not in this spiritual war. You're fighting against demons and principalities and all kinds of evil powers. See, it's so easy to just think carnally because it's hard to believe in what we don't see. We like concrete proof, and I, I get that. But it's more than just one dimension. The spiritual world is just as real, sometimes more as real as our physical world. And that's what Paul says. He says, you have to be dressed and ready because the enemy side, they're always dressed. They're at attention. They, they hold their post 24-7. And this afternoon, I was saddened a little bit. While everyone here makes my heart very happy, and I'm very proud of you on the flip side, some of you cause my heart to be really heavy because I have interceded for you time and time again. We may not have that personal conversation to let you know that I'm praying for you, but I want you to know that as a shepherd, I pray for you. And we're living in days where you can't get by with what you used to get by with, you know? Um, the enemy's ready. He's on all haunches. And he's ready to take a lot of Christians down if they're not dressed for success, if they're not dressed to win this battle. And how does he do it? Oh, he's a sly little fox. He'll do it by a little bit of complacency here and there and here. And he will even have you thinking, well, what I'm doing is not that bad. It really isn't. Like, I still, I still show up. I'll hang out in bed on Sunday mornings because, you know, I've, I've ran all week long. I'll use my finances to see if I can make a little money here and a little money there, and it's okay if I haven't paid my tithes. See, all of that, what's happening is each time that you're complacent in your lifestyle that you know, that you know is not living the right way, you're giving the enemy a stronghold in your life. That's what I say is breaking my heart because he, he's shown me that if things don't do a U-turn in some people's lives, I'm going to have them to counsel with a broken heart because you know better. So I'm telling you, not just as a pastor, but a friend, you know better. So it's time to do better. And we notice when you're not here. We notice. Especially if you've committed to something, we notice. So don't think it's not noticeable. You can just slip in the back and then slip back out, and nobody really sees if I'm there or not, right? See, God is the one that sees. But even more than that, the enemy sees. And he chuckles. And he laughs. He's like, they're almost there. We, we've almost got them where we want them. If we just keep at them just a little bit more, if we keep letting them just get, get upset over little things and keep feeding that little attitude of theirs and keep them real complacent, it won't really matter. It's okay. I've done this for so long. It doesn't really matter. See, the enemy will come in, and if you're not dressed for this battle, you're going to have some wounds, and those wounds may be fatal. So I'm asking as a friend, not just a pastor, 
I'm asking you to change your life in the ways that you know that you need to change your life in. Because these days that we're living in, yeah, it's going to sound a little redundant. They are different than any other days. But what I mean by that, biblically, we're living in a whole different stage of life right now. And things are winding up. And you know I'm not the one to call, call and cry out, oh, it's here, it's here, it's here. But my goodness, the signs. <laughs> You can't deny the signs that we don't have the time to, if you want to call it play, like we used to. We have to suit up because we're in this, we're in this battle. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, when that evil day comes, when all hell breaks loose on you, when you're overwhelmed and you're under attack and your world is falling apart and your dreams are shattered and your hope is gone he says, if you're suited up, if you got the helmet of truth on, you'll know what the Bible says is true. You'll know that God says that I'll never leave you in that battle alone. I'll never forsake you. And you know that the Bible says that whatever the enemy means for evil, if you give it to me, if you walk with me through it, I'm going to turn it around for good. See, he tells us how to prepare. He tells us that we're going to need the strength of the Lord. See, when he talks about heavenly places, he's talking about, ooh, not pretty heavenly places so much. He's talking about that spiritual realm. The heavenly places is what he calls that, where the spirits are, where the evil and the good spirits are. When you're trying to walk with God and being in the will of God and you're being attacked during those times, he says, be strong in the Lord so you can battle in that spiritual realm. Three times he tells us to stand firm. In other words, he's saying, don't quit. I know you're going to be tempted. I know that's the easy way out to throw in the towel, to walk away, to run, to move away. He says, but don't do it. I need you to stand in the Lord because then that's where your victory is because he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People aren't the source of our problem, believe it or not. They're just the vessel that, God, that the enemy will use. They are a conduit for our problem, but they are not the problem. If we address the resource, the person, without addressing the spirit, then all we've done is we've just delayed it. We haven't really changed anything. They can change their behavior for a little while, but sure enough, the old stuff comes back. So what do you do with that? You attack it through prayer. You attack the spirit that is causing that action in that person through prayer. That's how you win the battle. Paul says that the source is spiritual. And we're affected by the spiritual. He says to stand firm. And what that means is hold your spiritual ground don't be swayed or moved off center when you're suffering. Keep your eyes on your Savior. That's where your perspective should be. He says to grab more tightly to God and your faith and don't loosen your grip. Don't run from God. Run to God. He then tells us how to dress to win this battle. He says, I want you to get dressed for the battle. When you're in a military parade, you show off your sword. You show off your weapons. But when you're in the war, you use your weapons. It's a completely different situation. He tells us to dress and to use our weapons. In other words, it's not showtime, it's go time. And he says to put it on. He says, I want you to put on your righteousness. Righteousness, what does that mean? That means get in right standing with God. Try to align your life and your prayers and your will up with what God has for you. You'll still be attacked because that's how we grow, but the battle will be different. And you'll know if you're being attacked by the enemy or by God, if you're in right standing with God. One of the first ways to check it out is if you pray and the battle doesn't go away, 
then also you say, God, maybe you're not trying to change the battle. Maybe you're trying to change me. If you still get nothing on that one, then you know that the enemy is at work. But we so quickly want to attack with the enemy when a lot of times God's saying, no, I'm allowing it to get your attention. You've got to have this squirmish. You've got to have this little battle because I'm, I'm training you in warfare and I'm training you how to fight. See, so he wants you to put on the righteousness. He wants you to put on your helmet of salvation. And then you have to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In other words, you got to know what the Bible says. That's how, that's how Jesus defeated Satan. It's with the Word. Oh, he could have obliterated him like that, but he knew that thousands of years later, you and I would be reading this holy book. And he's showing us, this is how you, this is how you get the enemy back. This is how you win that war. He says, in that evil day, I want you to take a, take a stand. Whether it's attacking you spiritually, physically, emotionally, or mentally, he says, I want you to take a stand. And if you think, I can't remember all that that you said to put on. Is it the helmet of peace, or is the shoes of peace, or whatever? What is it? Well, I'm going to give you a little synopsis of a quick tip. And that's found in Romans 13, 14, and it says <laughs> to put on Christ. You put on Christ, you've got it all. What does that mean? That means to put on the mind of Christ, the mindset of Christ, the way that Christ would think about a situation. That means that when you put on Christ, you've already got truth because Jesus says, I'm the truth and I'm the light and I'm the way. When you put on Jesus, you've already got peace because they call him the Prince of Peace. When you put on Christ, you already have the word because it says that in the Bible that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, we always want to be Christ-centered. It's vital to our physical and spiritual well-being, especially in that evil day. You have to put on Christ, and how do we do it? Paul tells us with prayer, with prayer and supplication, prayer and communication. That means a relationship with God. See, the problem why we don't win a lot of our battles, you can't stand strong in the Lord if you haven't been standing with the Lord. See, because there's fallen angels, they're demons, and they want to attack. So how that works is the Bible tells us that when we are a believer that they are angels that are assigned to us. You have angels that will go to battle for you that will fight for you. And then you've got your fallen angels, those are demons, but those angels that are with you are waiting to hear from God for the action. And when you pray to God, he sends out to the messengers, to your angel, go to battle, fight for them. See, and the way that you do that is by standing in the Lord and praying to God. See, one of the jobs of the angels is to head off a demonic attack from you. Why? Because angels know how to fight. Angels. The Bible says when we pray, we bring God the, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus into the mix, and the Holy Spirit activates the angels that's assigned to you and I to deal with the demons that's coming against us. How great is that? It pays to stand in the right standing with your Heavenly Father. But here's the key. He says when you pray, you pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? Some people think it means to talk in tongues. That might be part of it. But that's not praying in the Spirit. We have Spirit, and we have what they call flesh. The Spirit is actually operating with a spiritual mindset. How you think about things. How you walk out your life, even the vocabulary that you use. If you have a spiritual mindset, you are walking in the spirit. If you have a spiritual mindset when you go to pray, you are praying in the spirit. And one way for you to know if, you're, if your prayer will really line up with God's mindset, with Jesus' mindset, 
I've said it before, but you can flip your prayer to start it out with, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you'll know right away if you're praying just a fleshly prayer. In Jesus' name, I want that car. In Jesus' name, I, I want that house. And it's okay to pray for your desires, but see, that's materialistic. He's saying, I want you to pray in the Spirit. So you can have that same prayer, and you can say, in Jesus' name. I'd like that car so I can make it to church. I'd like that car so it can be in a ministry to help bring you glory. See, now you've just went from this physical, fleshly thing, I want this car, to now you've got the mindset of Christ, of you're going to use that car to take yourself to church. You're going to use that car to help give somebody a ride if they need it. See, that, that changes that changes everything. So Paul says, pray in the spirit. You pray about those spiritual things first. Oh, God wants you to have nice things. He really does. I'm not against that at all. But take care of the spirit man first. Then God said, I'll give you all those desires of your heart. But keep Christ centered. See, there's a battle Within ourselves, there's a, there's a battle on the outside, and there's a battle that we have on our inside because we are flesh and we are spirit. And it battles because the flesh doesn't want to do what the spirit wants to do, and the spirit doesn't want to do what the flesh wants to do. And so there's a war going on, even if nowhere else, there's a war going on inside of us. And he says, here's how you conquer that one. You pray in the spirit. Don't pray in the flesh. To play in the front flesh is to have your desire without putting God in the picture. To put your desire over his will. When you pray in the spirit, it overrides the desires of the flesh. You might say, God, I've got X amount of dollars and here's what I'd really like to do with it. But God, what would you like me to do with it? That's being mature, and that's praying in the Spirit, because I guarantee you, if you'll follow what he wants you to do with your finances, he'll bless your finances. You won't always be struggling. But what are you doing with your finances? See, pray with the mindset of Christ. If prayer becomes a lifestyle, then walking in the Spirit also becomes... A lifestyle. It's not an event and it's not just when the battle comes. It's you are prepared before the battle gets there. When you're prepared before the battle gets there, you go into that battle already with victory. God's already won it. You just have to tie up the loose ends. Then when that evil day comes, then the evil one is the one that's defeated. See, God will give us victory and he will deliver us. He'll either deliver us from that battle or he'll give us strength to go through the battle. However he does it though, he's right there with you. One of the Bible verses that gives me such comfort is even when other people walk away, relationships end, people die, God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So the battle's already won, but you just have to be dressed for the battle. And since the battle's already won, and we need to be dressed for a battle, let's make sure that we're all on the same side. Let's make sure that our fiery darts and our swords doesn't wound the person next to us that's also fighting on the same side. And the way that we can help become more unified is if we'll remember that the person's not the problem. The spirit that's driving the person, that's the problem. And so I think now tonight you'll have a little bit more knowledge of how to use those wars in, of weapon. And not only will you fight for yourself, but now you'll know how to use them to fight for your loved ones, your wounded ones. So the best way that we can start this is the closing song is Jesus at the center.
So before we go tonight, think about what the center of your life is. Maybe you need to change your perspectives or your priorities just a little bit. And if you have got Jesus in the center, then that is great. Then pray for people that are still struggling with that. And the reason I, I talk about it so much is because I don't want you wounded. And I wouldn't be a good shepherd if I didn't tell you, if you don't watch out, there's a cliff over there and there's a wolf right around the corner. And if you don't stay unified and stay in Christ's flock, I'm afraid the enemy can take you out. So I'm asking again as a pastor and as a friend, tonight in closing, spend some time. Spend some time tonight thinking about where your life is and where it's going. And have you, have you been complacent? Have you lost a little bit of passion for your Heavenly Father? If so, the right thing is, is all you have to do is ask him, say, God, fill me back up again. I don't kind of like this callous person that I've become. Let me be who I used to be if that's where you need to go. And if you've always been callous, then say, God, I need you to soften my heart so I can be like how you want me to be. I'll fight for you. You fight for me. Holding God's hand, and the devil doesn't have a chance. God bless you. I wanted to talk to those of you that have children in your household. God gives us angels because we can't fight the demons the way that the angel can. We're part of it, but we can't. We know the tips and the, the angel knows the tips and the tricks because we're weak in certain areas. When you are having children in your household, you are fighting for them physically and spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. You are, you are the one that is to be the, the protector from the demons. So I'm saying this out of love. If you have children in your household, it's very important that you are number one in church. It's very important, number two, that you live a lifestyle that doesn't open the door to the demons to come in. Because if God would for one second show you that spiritual world of what happens when you get complacent and get lazy and it's no big deal and it's just a drink here and it's just a drink there and it's just an just a, a, just a X-rated movie here and just an X-rated movie there. If you saw what was attached to that and your little one sleeping innocent in the bedroom in there, that would be a game changer for you. So... I'm also going to talk to those that don't have children in their household. But maybe you have children that aren't living the way that they should be. Maybe you've got grandchildren that don't even really know about this Jesus. You are a soldier that's standing in that battle for them. That's why the devil tries to wear you out so bad. So remember why you do what you do and the purpose behind it. It's not, it's not just for you. It's for all of those that you love and those that God has put into your life. So dress up. Be the warrior for your children. Be the warrior for your babies. Be the warrior for your grandchildren. Be the warrior for your loved ones because they're counting on you. They're counting on you to keep them safe. They're counting on you to show them the right way to live. So I'm going to ask God to strengthen you in that walk. And if you need brothers and sisters to pray with you, if you need a pastor to talk to, I'm your girl. Call me up. I'll talk to you. I'll walk this, I'll walk this road with you till you can stand on your own two feet. But you're not alone. But we are in a battle. And it's time to suit up. God bless you. Bless you, Kim. I was okay till she asked me to pray. <laughs> I just have to take a humble stance before him. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your spirit here tonight. Thank you for your word that was spoken. Lord, for the words that went to our hearts and out through this building. Lord, let it change tonight. Let each one of us make those changes in our lives and in our hearts.
not only for ourselves, but our unsaved loved ones, for our town, for our city, for our neighbor, for our country, and for this world. That you would just be with us this week, Lord, just out of your mercy, Lord, and out of your grace, just gently show us. Lord, help us, Lord. Change our hearts to seek after you, Lord, to put you first above everything else. Lord, I ask that you would be with us, that you would watch over our pastor, Lord, exceedingly abundantly. Lord, that your spirit would go with us as we go out this week, Lord, and that you would be with us. And I ask it all in Jesus' name, amen.